Ray's team has begun to meddle already. <laughs> if I'm going to sing, I will let you know a long time beforehand. I'm going to save that for heaven, I believe. That way more of you will stay in church that way rather than coming and leaving before it's over. We're glad you're here this morning. Glad you've come to share in this service. Oh, what a wonderful day to be in the house of the Lord. There will be no small group tomorrow evening, no ladies' Bible study on Tuesday morning this week. We will have prayer meeting and choir practice Wednesday night, so keep those things in mind. A week from this coming Wednesday, the 16th, we will be having our uh, church Thanksgiving dinner, potluck, so keep that in mind. That will be 6.30 on the 16th. Good to be in God's house. We're glad you're here today. I hope that you have come expecting this morning Amen. God to do something in your life. I have found out in my own life if I come expecting, <coughs> if I come looking for God to do something, He is more likely to move in my life than if I sit back and say, Oh Lord, bless me. Lord, bless me if you can. Hope you've come expecting this morning God to do something special. Let's go to Him in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank You this morning for Your wonderful love, Your wonderful mercy, for Your provisions for our life. And this morning, Lord, as we gather in Your name, I pray that You bless in this time that we spend together, that everything that is said and done would glorify and praise the wonderful name of Jesus. Be with us now in this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Praise God. The reading of God's Word. The scripture is found in Hebrews 8, 10 through 13. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith, a new covenant he hath made, hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for the privilege of coming to a house of worship to learn more about you and to hear your word. We pray, Father, that you will bless each one of us today as we worship. For we ask it in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Several years ago, there was a beautiful hotel that was built down in Galveston, Texas. And it was built right over the water in the Gulf of Mexico. And the thing that was interesting is that the balconies on each floor looked right over the Gulf. Ideal place for fishing. And when they first opened, a fisherman came in with his rod and reel and decided to fish from his balcony. Well, through his clumsiness or whatever, all he managed to do was break the windows on the floor below him. Well, the management very quickly got signs and put them up and said, no fishing from the balconies. You know what happened? Everybody began to fish from the balconies. They began to think, well, I never even thought about it, but that makes sense to me. So more and more people began to fish and more and more windows got broken. And the hotel didn't really know what to do until finally one bright executive said, let's take all the no fishing signs down. And they did. And you know what happened? Well, they stopped fishing. They stop fishing. This story demonstrates to us one of the shortcomings of the law. You know, we've talked in the past about the positive things about God's <coughs> law. We've said that God's law is holy, it's just, and it's good. And God's law shows us what sin is. However, there are at least two shortcomings of the law. The first one is 
not only does it reveal what the law is to us, it really or actually causes us to want to commit sin. It leads us into more sin. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 7. But sin, taking opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. The law says, do not covet. And when the sinful nature hears that, the first thing the sinful nature is covet. Hmm, that sounds like a good idea. So that command that was meant to bring life actually stirs up sin within me. There is something about the law that produces the rebellious spirit within us. Have you ever walked by a door that has a sign on it that says, wet paint, do not touch? Now, maybe you've walked by that door a thousand times in the last ten years, and you have never, ever had a desire to even touch that door. But now that that sign is there, you want to really touch it and see if it's wet, don't you? There's just some desire within you that says, oh, you've got to touch it to see if it's wet. Or you tell little Johnny to stay out of the cookie jar. You go in the other room and you hear that lid rattling. The other shortcoming of the law is this. The law can tell me what I'm doing wrong, but it can't make me do better. Paul said, so far as I was concerned, the good law, which was supposed to show me the way of life, instead resulted in my being given the death penalty. So God's law was intended to lead us to live godly lives, but it didn't succeed. God's law tells us what I ought not to do. It tells me what the punishment is if I don't obey the rules, but keeping the rules doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be a change within my heart on the inside. And no matter how good you are, there's no way in the world that you can keep all the rules all the time. It's not that there's anything wrong with God's rules. There's something wrong with us on the inside. Fortunately, what the law was not able to do, God accomplished through another means. Paul tells us, for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. So we need to give thanks to God for his law, but we need to give even more thanks for his son who created a way so that we could have a personal relationship with God the Father. The title of the sermon this morning is The Better Covenant. Many years ago there was a television commercial that had a little jangle that went like this. My dog's better than your dog. My dog's better than yours. Some of you shaking your heads, some of you younger ones are know. The writer in, in, in Hebrews chapter 8 tells us that Jesus, the new covenant, is better than the old covenant because Jesus is the priest. And how true that is. Now, the law of Moses declared that God's holy standard, but it could never provide a means or a way for me to be able to meet those rules. In the first covenant, the law was imposed from a group of uh, tables of rock tablets of rock. We call it the Ten Commandments. But it was opposed or composed and it failed because there was no disposition of the heart to follow it. We had the rules, we had the writing, but we didn't have a change in our heart, so we didn't follow it. The law was good, but our heart was bad. It wasn't right. Well, in the New Covenant, God changes and transforms the external law into an inner life and through the gift of the Holy Spirit, he so purifies and so renews the heart that from our inmost being, it becomes the nature to want to do what the will of God is. When you have that change in your heart, you don't have to have the preacher preach at you and shake his finger at you and say, you should do this, you should do that. You ought to make him want to. That's what having that second covenant blessing in your heart means. You don't have to be told to do it. It's just second nature. You do what God wants you to do. And furthermore, the law being put into the mind suggests such a communication of divine truth with all the heart's affection, but it intelligently interprets and expresses a love of holy living within the believer. We've been changed. The old has passed away, and behold, everything has become new. And since this vital feature of the new covenant is spiritual life is in our innermost being, 
our hearts are changed. We no longer think the way we used to. We no longer do the things that we used to. We no longer act the way we used to because we've been changed. And all these things, they lead immediately to a personal knowledge of God. Paul said, or writer to the Hebrews said, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we can receive grace and mercy at the time we need it the most. We don't feel that we can't, now we feel that we can. We can come boldly to God's throne because we have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Him. We know Him and He knows us. This new covenant is internal and it's written on the heart and the mind. Now, to the Hebrews, the heart was the receiver of all the outside impressions and it was the agent that transformed ideas into action. Proverbs 4.23 tells us, Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. And Luke 6.45 tells us the good man brings out the good things that have been stored up in his heart, and the evil man brings out the evil things that have been stored in his heart. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. You see, God wants to breathe his very will into our lives. He wants us to be more and more like Him and more and more willing to joyfully obey His will. And when we get involved in that second covenant, it's not a matter if we have to or have someone point their finger at us. It becomes second nature. We just do it because it's the joy. We want to make our Father happy. Have you ever noticed how your children can make you feel happy when they want to? When they don't want to, they can do that too, can't they? But your children know what it is to make you happy. And so do we. But when we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we begin to understand in His people's affection. And His people are given the inward assurance of belonging totally, wholly to God. You know, when we totally give God everything and we totally trust our lives with God, when the tough times come, we can kind of smile at the tough times and say, God, have you got a mess to clean up? I don't know how you're going to do it, but boy, go get it. It's yours now because I'm your son and I've got a problem that you need to take care of, and God does. But since, however, the carnal mind is not subject to the law of God, the heart has to be purified before it can become perfectly attuned to the will of God. For it's only the pure in heart that will see God. And without holiness, no one will see the Lord. The purifying of the heart from sin and the writing of the law upon the heart, which is a conscious personal experience, is something that's wrought, that means brought in by the Holy Spirit of God. <coughs> But we don't rest in that experience. We rest in God, don't we? 